Dear colleagues, welcome to this symposium on transcatheter options for the management of heart failure patients with MR or TR. My name is Jeroen Bax. I come from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Today, we have two excellent speakers, Michael Boehm, a heart failure specialist from Germany, and Stefan von Bardeleben, a specialist in the field of transcatheter heart valve therapy, also from Germany, and also two very, very good friends. This session will focus on the use of optimal medical therapy and transcatheter heart valve repair in patients with heart failure and concomitant mitral regurgitation and or tricuspid regurgitation. And we specifically highlight and focus within that framework, the new ESC heart failure and heart valve guidelines. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Michael Boehm to provide his lecture supporting heart failure treatment through transcatheter valve therapy. Michael, please, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Joran. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, next slide, please. Uh, it's my task now to discuss with you the interference between medical treatment and valve disease. So here I brought this slide to show you that uh, indeed heart failure follows uh, a sequence, which means there is a progressive remodeling, which is affected by triggers and neuroendocrine activation and also by comorbidities. And what you can see if in systolic heart failure, so heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the heart progressively dilates, of course, of course, that also involves the valves. Next slide. And you can see that this is a mechanism. And next slide. So the question is, next one. The question is whether removing and reversal of these mechanisms make the valves better. And therefore, indeed, medical therapy could improve also remodeling and thereby valve disease. Next. So this is here what has been done. And this is the mainstay of heart failure therapy. We know that these neuroendocrine mediators are the key players in progressive remodeling, and therefore antagonizing them with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and lately also with Entresto, beta blockers, and spironolactone is a mainstay of heart failure. Next slide to improve outcomes and also to improve remodeling. However, what you can see here is that the DO remodeling effects, so the inverse remodeling effects, are not very are not very, uh, not very expressed in several of these agents. So you can see here, which is taken from older studies in the red line, the progressive remodeling in placebo groups, here the change of ejection fraction. And what you can see that carvedilol indeed has, uh, has, has a deal remodeling effect, while the effect, by the way, of ACE inhibitors, um, in contrast to the belief of many, is not very expressed. So the next slide shows you uh, the new guideline, next slide, uh, which has now introduced new therapies in first line. So this was the, discussed in depth. We have in particular the ARNI as first line drugs and also uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. And of course, the ARNI has now already data on their effects on remodeling. Next slide. And this is uh, shown why this was put in first stage. Here you can see that all of the drugs here uh, have a start of uh, action very early. You can see 12 days with the Emperor Reduce study, and all of the drugs work principally within the first 30 days to reduce outcomes. And therefore, the recommendation now is to start early, not to postpone treatments to av avoid adverse outcomes. Next slide. And here's the remodeling effect, which has been nicely shown in the proved study. And indeed, Zacopitril Visatan, together with the AT1 blocker, has, a reason, uh, has re really shown that this has the strongest de remodeling effect, which might affect the valve. You can see the line of neutrality. And you can see that more than 80% of the patient improved with ejection fraction. And this is accompanied by de remodeling because end diastolic and systolic volume indices go down as well, as well as light atrial volume. So the question arises of whether they can do something to valve function. Next slide. 
And this was studied in the prime study, a very interesting study from uh, South Korea. And you can see by treating people uh, uh, with Zacopitril Vaisatan in comparison to, uh, to Vaisatan alone, you can see that indeed uh, some of these and uh, many of these patients improved and nobody uh, 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 worsened here on this treatment. So what is tested here is the effect of neprilysin inhibition uh, against uh, the only effect of AT1 blockade. However, next slide, you can see easily from here that after three months after implantation, uh, people should be re-evaluated concerning ejection fraction and valve function uh, because the ventricle deremodal. Dero next slide. But what is also seen here that indeed in 55% is this portion remodeling is not sufficient also to improve valve function. So there are still many patients who are left over for the valve intervention. Next slide. And here you can see what has been done, the effects of valve repair. Uh, and this is very well known, this is the COAP study. And you can see that hospitalization for heart failure has this huge effect when the COAP criteria are applied. And this translates also in all cause mortality. However, next slide, people might think that these people are not treated, but you can see the reason is that the mitral clip effect, if you just compare the different trials, which is not scientifically very sound, but the mitral clip effect here on outcomes is as good as for all the proven other interventions. Next slide. And so people were suggesting whether these people were maybe inadequately treated, and that is not the case. You can see here the excellent pharma treatment in the co study, 90% beta blockers, and in particular, 50% uh, of mineralocorticoid antagonists. And that means that the treatment was as good as as many heart failure trials. Next slide. So therefore, uh, this concerns also the doses. Next slide. And therefore, uh, what has now been recommended in the guideline, and this is a guideline to really fix, uh, indeed, the indication for involvement of secondary mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure. It should be a harm team decision. So when people have persistent symptoms, then indeed after discussion in the heart team with echocardiography uh, uh, evaluation, a percutaneous uh, uh, intervention should be considered. And this is a class 2A or class 2B when the criteria are fulfilled on the right-hand side, you can see that it should, could be considered. So this is an individual decision. So this is a very detailed, um, uh, detailed uh, um, uh, recommendation in the guideline. Next slide. And you can see that these are the criteria, criteria which really makes uh, the, dis the decision. So ejection fraction below 20 and uh, uh, above 30 is not recommended. And therefore the message is one should not wait until heart failure is so much progressed that these criteria are not fulfilled because I show you in the uh, later parts of the trial that then um, the outcomes are poor. Next slide. So this is the final recommendation. Uh, there is a mitral regulation as a 2A uh, criterion if the criteria are fulfilled and B because it's one study uh, and this is principally uh, based on the main study I've shown you before. And then you can find in this uh, in this slide the detailed description on the decision making. Next slide. Okay, mitral primary mitral regurgitation, which is caused by abnormalities, is also uh, uh, recommended if heart failure symptoms might occur and surgery is contraindicated. And in severe heart failure, the risk obviously is increased. And of course, also percutaneous valve repair can be considered. Next slide. So now what about uh, the tricuspid uh, uh, regurgitation? So of course, when there is mitral valve disease, next slide please, then the right ventricle will get compromised. And if mitral tricuspid regurgitation is occurring, then you can see that there is an exaggerated uh, and reduced survival rate if it's significant uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Next slide. And indeed we have circumstantial evidence that if a uh, transcatter valve intervention is successful, then apparently in this one of the first studies, there is an improvement of outcome. 
uh, free from heart failure survival and overall survival. But however, this is not a dedicated next slide trial. Uh, uh, and therefore, these are the recommendations. It's again a hard team decision, including the heart failure specialist, to put the indication up front. And then, indeed, it was here for, made the point that indeed it was safe, the procedure. But we need further studies to scrutinize an evidence level which is not present here and therefore cannot be mentioned in this guideline. Next slide. So, finally, uh, what happens? If we have here a possibility of reverse remodeling by valve interventions and drugs, what about if we are beyond reversibility? Next slide. And this indeed was put forward in the guideline to look at the echo criteria. And here you can see in a, a subdivided population, it's a study from Japan, where you can see when people have a low EF and pulmonary hypertension, then indeed the uh, event rate and the outcomes uh, becomes poor. And therefore there is also a time point where it can be too late. So it should be considered according to the guideline when the poor up criteria are fulfilled. Next slide. So here you can see the same data with the outcome, high EF, excellent prognosis. However, beyond a certain point, the outcome is very poor with a 50, uh, percent mortality after one year. Next slide. Okay, so therefore this year in summary is the uh, uh, summary slide. You can see that after initiation of beta blockers, uh, it comes to the subgroup and one of them is here mitral regurgitation, which is here in this position here. It's a 2A criteria when the criteria are fulfilled and that is the reason why it is indeed in the guidelines. Next slide. Okay, progressive remodeling, and this is my take home slide, is a pathophysiological basis for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In the long run, it might affect mild valve, mitral valve disease and dysfunction, and then in turn also tricuspid disease. The ARNI should be introduced and the full medical uh, and guideline directed medication. After three months, everything should be reassessed. And if mitral regurgitation is fulfilled and the co criteria are fulfilled, one should readily go for it. Otherwise, because next slide, uh, the valve and uh, uh, the uh, remodeling is too advanced and therefore the message is also don't be too late on, to initiate these treatments. Last slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a wonderful lecture, um, very clear and very precisely taking us through actually these new guidelines. We have different new guidelines and two big ones, two big players that go hand in hand. It's basically the ESC heart failure guidelines and the ESC heart valve guidelines. So as you see here in this slide on the um, panel, you see the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The first layer for all patients is medical treatment. And you've seen the medications already several times that are now recommended to start. After that, you triage basically your patients and you look at certain other aspects. And that is where additional things come in. So in the 2021 ESC heart failure guidelines, as Michael Boehm has shown, there is a clear recognition for mitral valve repair through transcatheter technologies. And this is really new. Can I go to my next slide, please? Yep. So this next slide actually shows us that there is a specific focus on secondary MR management, a class 2A, class 2A recommendation based on the one big trial, the COAP trial, for symptomatic heart failure patients with severe secondary MR. And you see that clearly displayed here. If I go to my third slide, please. There is not so much news on TR treatment. There are a lot of small studies popping up and being done that show benefit, but large randomized trials, as we always say, are needed. However, in the meantime, we have patients to treat. We see them every day. And we have transcatheter valve therapies available for significant TR. 
my next slide, please. So now we switch to the ESC uh, in joint collaboration with the European Association Cardiothoracic Surgery on valvular heart disease. We look here first at primary MR. In the valvular heart disease guidelines, transcatheter valve repair in severe primary MR. That means this is a disease of the heart valve itself. Prolapses, etc. In patients deemed inoperable at high surgical risk is recommended with a class 2B indication. And I go to my next slide, please. If we now look at secondary MR, for secondary MR, it's a different story. Same like the heart failure guidelines, a class 2A recommendation based on the one randomized trial, uh, the co-op trial. Class 2A recommendation is given for transcatheter mitral valve repair in secondary MR. My next slide, please. This is the last slide that I'm presenting to you. So this is the ESC and uh, surgical valvular heart disease guidelines again, focusing on tricuspid regurgitation. I already mentioned to you, transcatheter valve therapy in patients with severe secondary TR. And severe secondary TR is by far the most TR that we see is 90% almost of our TR patients. At high surgical risk is given a class 2B recommendation. Thank you for presenting the slides. And now I would like to start discussion with our two colleagues, Michael Boehm and Stefan from Bartenleben. So my first question to you, Michael, you're an expert on heart failure management and more specifically the use of medical therapy. What does this ESC heart failure guideline tell us about when to use GDMT, guideline directed medical therapy, and when to consider TMVR and TTVR? the respective transcatheter mitral and transcatheter uh, tricuspid valve repair. What's your view on this? So first of all, what is really new in the guideline is that we are away from this very slow sequencing of drug. We have four drugs who are first line drugs, beta blocker, MRA, the ARNI or an ACE inhibitor in several areas of the world and uh, the beta blocker. And these four drugs should be initiated early. And I've shown you one slide that all of these effects um, is indeed occurring within the first 14 days, 30 days. So postponing and deferral of treatment to later time point causes events. And this is very nicely seen in the new SGLT2 trials where you can see that the curves separate very early and the treatment effect is significant after 14 days. So then among all these drugs, the uh, uh, Zacubitril Visartan might have the strongest de-remodeling effect. And this affects also the valve function. And I've shown the prime trial, which in my knowledge is the first and only trial looking at that. And you can see that some patients indeed improve with valve function. Also, they should of course be uvolemic. And then the reassessment after three to six months should be done. And this applies for valve interventions, also for CRT, and ICD, and then you might take the decision to go for that. But after three to six months, the majority of patients still stay with significant mitral valve disease and should have the procedure. Prolonging further, then it happens the same as with drugs. There might be progressive remodeling because a non-response to drugs select patients in a really poor condition, and then it might be too late, and you are beyond the criteria of co apt and then um, I've shown you the data. If you have terminal heart failure, it might be too late. And therefore, it should, it should be waited, but it should not be waited too long. Otherwise, uh, we will lose patients. So I think for you out there in the audience, it's very important to realize what Michael just emphasized. The message here is that we should not wait too long while switching from medical and adding or thinking about transcatheter heart valve therapies. Because if the medication doesn't do the job, let's say in severely dilated ventricles, then we need to come with transcatheter therapies. So now let me switch to you, Stefan. Stefan, you're an expert on transcatheter heart valve therapy. 
what do the guidelines tell us about the use of TMVR and TTVR? Yeah, I think there has been a major upgrade now in the guidelines con uh, compared to 2017 and also a major alignment to the US guidelines published in uh, December 2020. So what the guidelines say is that we should not wait and that tier therapy is an adjunct to guideline-directed medical therapy. So guideline-directed medical therapy, as put out by Michael Berg, should always be first. But there is a new publication by Cyber Carr on the 10th of August this year that actually shows that if we reduce MR uh, either to mild or to moderate, versus moderate to severe or a severe mitral regurgitation, we have a survival benefit. This is a decrease in mortality and in hospitalization between 40 to 70 percent. And I think the patients should take benefit. To be clear in the COAP trial, we could also say that we have two groups. So one group is fulfilling the COAP criteria. Here we aim for hospitalization improvement uh, for, palliate, for, for a situation where symptoms decrease and also mortality decreases. And there is a second group that does not totally fulfill uh, the co-op criteria. And here we aim for a better clinical scenario for the patients, less dyspnea, less symptoms, longer walking distance, also very important criteria in heart failure. So we have to take these two groups. One group is a 2A recommendation, which is an upgrade to the last guidelines where it was 2B, and the other group remains 2B, but is still in the guidelines. And in tricuspid, the European guidelines are the first to mention transcatheter repair. And there we have uh, currently a scenario of studies with hundreds of patients, and we're aiming for 1,500 in randomized control trials in the next two years. And that's really interesting. And the whole field is shifting in a very, uh, I would say, positive uh, mode. So we're integrating now all these heart failure medications, transcatheter valve, all by aiming to further improve the outcomes of our patients. You also mentioned symptomatic treatment, which is very important because if you ask a patient what's now important for you, living longer or less symptoms, many heart failure patients would say, I'd like to have less symptoms. Let me switch now back to you, Michael, and we need to keep a bit an eye on the time here. So um, the first question that I have to you, ARNI and SDLT2 inhibitors, very, very successful drugs. At what stage do you use them in your heart failure patients? So usually in symptomatic heart failure in everyone, the question how to start, uh, we have four drugs starting with every uh, drug in the, um, uh, uh, in the setting of hospitalization is useful. Uh, there is also a, a chapter in the guidelines how to do things. And there is also the recommendation already starting in the hospital. So by bringing the patient back after three months, you can judge valve disease. So that accelerates thing. And also when people are transferred from the hospital to the outpatient situation in several uh, systems, it might cause a problem, but bringing them back to the same place for the reevaluation of valve disease that I think makes a lot of sense. So starting them early, if a patient has a high heart rate and a low blood pressure, you start with the beta blocker and evabradine having a stable heart failure, the ARNI, but SGLT2 inhibitors and also drugs like a plerinone have almost zero effects on blood pressure and you can start them right away. And I think the major achievement is that we are getting faster and we are getting faster with the drug therapy, but we might also be getting faster with the valve therapy in consequence. So another very short question. What do the new heart failure and valvular heart disease guidelines recommend regarding maximizing the dose of GDMT versus the timing of mitral valve repair? In other words, do we need to reach maximum dose of GDMT before we consider mitral valve repair, or can we already go earlier? So the, the reason of uh, this early layering of treatment is that we do not wait and up-titrate, up-titrate. The maximal dose in heart failure therapy usually cannot be achieved. We have to it's a misnomer. It's a maximally tolerated dose, and that is a different. And when you see patients who are not tolerating the dose, these patients are associated with a particular poor prognosis. So exactly these patients should be evaluated for further interventions like CRT and also valve interventions, 
because they cannot tolerate the drug. And that is an indicator of poor outcome. And that is re really where we're going. Huh? So let me now switch briefly to Stefan. Stefan, we're running short of time. So I'm going to keep it short, short answer. But based on the recent heart failure and valve, height, valve heart disease guidelines and the data from COEPT and CLASP, how do you select the optimal timing for transcatheter mitral valve repair? As Michael put it, um, if the patient is at the acceptance level of his guideline-directed medical therapy, which should be initiated first, start, or, and if there is severe mitral regurgitation and the patient is symptomatic, this is very important, with a relatively smaller ventricle, then the benefit to the patient is maximized. And we have seen that also in co-op, that the medication could be even up titrated after the initiation of the reduction of mitral regurgitation. So don't treat too late. This was also already mentioned in Michael Berm's uh, slide deck. And that is the perfect introduction to um, Stefan from Barden Leibniz talk. We look forward to your lecture, successful treatment, MR and TR patients of a differentiated transcatheter valve technologies, please. Thank you, Jaron. Thank you, Michael. I'll keep it short. So uh, next slide, please. These are my conflicts, next slide. So uh, one of the iterations, and we have seen that the guidelines now mention tier therapy, which is a, a unifier for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So the emphasis is like in surgery on repair, and the other emphasis is on the transcatheter method. You see two iterations. One above is the classic Pascal, and but there is a new iteration, which is the Pascal ACE, which is more narrow, central spacer is slightly smaller and it complies to a lot of positions uh, in ischemic mitral valve as well as tricuspic valve regurgitation in secondary and in primary disease. Next slide please. So we have new data on the Pascal platform for MR and as you can see what is not as much mentioned actually in the guidelines, I was surprised, is also that we have a survival and um, a clinical symptom scenario, which is improved if the regurgitation improvement is better. And you see here that we are now able to achieve about 80% uh, in a surgical-like manner. And this is also true in secondary uh, disease where surgery has more problems than in primary disease. On the right hand side is you see something that has not been shown directly in the co-op trial where there was no remodeling in the treatment group but there was negative remodeling in the control group that was randomized and in the latest iterations with the newest uh, tier systems you can see that we can also achieve in a here in a mixture of primary and secondary disease but also in secondary disease a positive lv remodeling over time and this has been shown here in two years next slide Switching briefly to the tricuspid uh, platform use, you can also see that the results here are very favorable. If you look on the baseline, you see that we have a five grade scheme where the majority of patients is in grade four or five. So they have torrential or massive regurgitation. And you see with the lines that they individually switch down up to two grades uh, to the better, achieving a one plus two plus a scenario in 86% of the cases and even accepting at least in TR severe means 93%. What is unique and not yet mentioned because of the small study sizes is the very low complication and death rate and you see that unlike COAP where we had a combined endpoint of death and um, hospitalization uh, in the range of 40 to 50% and death rates beyond 20%, you see here that the death rate at one year is lower than the intra-hospital mortality for isolated tricuspid surgery. Um, so it's only 6.7% at one year with almost nil in the first 30 days. Next, and on the right-hand side, you see also remodeling of the annulus. Next slide, please. Yes, next slide. And here you see the impact on New York Heart Association and also a 72 meter improvement in six minute walk. Thank you very much, Michael and um, uh, Stefan, yeah. sorry about that. So dear colleagues, we see now in our practice more and more patients with heart failure and secondary MR and TR. Today, we learned a lot from these two experts. We need to start with GDMT, including ARNI and STLT2 inhibitors at an early stage, earlier, earlier, earlier. 
to support LV function and prevent further LV remodeling. And likewise, we need to treat severe MR earlier using transcatheter valve therapy. Percutaneous edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair should be considered for outcome improvement in carefully selected patients who remain symptomatic despite optimized medical therapy with moderate to severe or severe SMR and fulfilling the inclusion criteria of the co-op study, which is a class two recommendation according to both heart failure and ESC, EACTS, valvular heart disease guidelines. And also we realize that concomitant severe TR may need earlier transcatheter treatment. Preliminary results show improvement in TR severity as shown by Stefan and symptoms with low complication rates. While further prospective studies are needed to show the prognostic impact of these treatments in heart failure patients, both guidelines, valvular heart disease and heart failure, give a class 2B recommendation to transcatheter tricuspid valve repair. In 2021, where we are now, we now have the medication and we have excellent transcatheter therapies to give the best treatment to our heart failure patients. I thank again both speakers and Edwards Life Science for arranging this excellent session. And I thank also ESC for the flexibility of going a few minutes over. Thank you very much. And I hope you learned like I did.